Praise the Lord. Memorial Day is tomorrow, and we all celebrate it, and to different people it means different things. To some people, as was said earlier, it's the beginning of summer. To some people, it's a long weekend. To others, they think of barbecue and, and uh, family and gathering together and so forth and so on. But quite honestly, Memorial Day is one of the most important holidays that we observe in our great nation because it is a day that we honor those who have given all to secure our freedom and our liberty. And we are acutely aware that as the scripture tells us that liberty is purchased by blood. We owe those that shed their blood for us a debt that we could not ever repay. All we can do is to remember them, and as General George Patton said, not mourn, but thank God that such men lived. The poet Walt Whitman, over 150 years ago, stood at the graves of a father and a son who were killed in one of the battles that America has fought. And as he stood there before the graves, he penned these words. He said, O strong dead march, dead march, you please me. O moon immense, with your silvery face you soothe me. O my soldiers twain, O my veterans passing to burial, what I have I also give you. The moon gives you light, and the bugles and the drums give you music, and my heart, oh my soldiers, my veterans, my heart gives you love. Now this is what Memorial Day means to me more than anything else. It means love. Love of freedom, love of country, and love of all the brave Americans who answered the call of duty and gave their lives for you and for me. They were mostly boys, some girls, and they were true heroes. I think about the word hero and the way that, like many words in our language today, have been compromised, watered down, Uh, bastardized. Today, a hero is ascribed, the word hero is ascribed to many. But by definition, a hero is one because of achievement or uh, or accomplishment, because of something they did. You hear today that all the nurses, all the medical people, all the first responders, are heroes, but I don't agree. I don't think that drawing a paycheck and wearing a uniform makes a person a hero. All have that opportunity, perhaps, to become one. But a hero, a true hero, is one who runs in when everybody else is running out. And not every wearer of a uniform and receiver of a paycheck has that in their resume. Today on Memorial Day across our nation, many will decorate their graves, caress their photos, shed tears when we remember. And it is right that we should do so. But there's another aspect to honoring their memory and their sacrifice. I want to read to you the uh, words of, uh, well, where did up, there it is, sorry. That's not it. What did I, there it is, sorry. I want to read to you the words. These words were written in 1863 at the dedication of a national cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Spoken, of course, 
by our president, 16th President Abraham Lincoln. He said, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. Conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or to detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to here be dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave their last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. I don't think that ever in history these words have been more appropriate or more needful to observe. He talks about our dedication to the unfinished work, our increased devotion to the cause that was set forth there. To keep this nation, <clears throat> the greatest nation that the earth has ever seen. As the videos have said, as we all know, this sacrifice was the ultimate sacrifice that we honor today. But freedom is worth it. But we now have a responsibility. And with our barbecue, and with our celebration, and with our decoration, we must also add and continue to recognize what our role is in these things. Now our service began with the video of the United States Marine Corps class singing the days of Elijah. I don't know about you, but that stirred me because with young men like that, men who have the training that is second to none in the world, but also have a covenant with our God, Jehovah God, the Lord Jesus Christ, nothing can defeat that. Nothing. No one, no power, no ism can defeat it. But we must observe that we also have a very important part to play. I want to share two scriptures with you this morning. first one is found in the book of Malachi, chapter 4. Malachi was the final book written in the Old Testament. And the final words that the Spirit of God declared to His Old Covenant people. And didn't speak again through the prophets until John the Baptist came on the scene. They were spoken by Malachi, and in the fourth chapter, the fifth and sixth verse, he concludes the book of Malachi with, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. I particularly look at that fifth verse, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Think about it. The day that he speaks of is both great and dreadful. Now who is it great to and who is it dreadful to? That all depends on the who, not on God. 
for the believer, these are going to be the greatest days that the world has ever seen. For the unbeliever and the enemies of God, these are going to be dreadful days. Paul writes to Timothy and said, in the last days, perilous times will come. And we're seeing these things unfold before our lives. But it's so important that we recognize that it's all about what we focus on. Not the circumstances, but how we read the signs of the times. We can make the decision as believers to make these the greatest days rather than following the spirit of the world and lamenting over the fact that these are bad days. I'll send you Elijah the prophet and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers. The other scripture is found in James chapter 5 verse 17 through 18. And it reads this way. James' commentary on this prophet was, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. I like those first words of verse 17. Elijah was a man. Elijah was a man. We have a tendency sometimes to look at these Old Testament characters, or even the modern mentors and leaders, that many of whom are depicted here on the stage, their photographs that we put up here to honor and to remind us of our roots. We lionize, we, we, we idolize, we, we put these men in a separate category and on a pedestal sometimes. But Elijah was a man. He was a man just like you. He was a man with like passions. In other words, he feared the same things you and I fear. He hated the same things you and I hate. He, 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 he felt the same things that you and I feel. He was a man, but he changed the world. One must never underestimate the power of one man who walks in the power of the Spirit of God. God sent Elijah to clean some things up, to straighten some things out. And he foretold that the spirit of Elijah would appear again, not the man, though the man's coming, but that's a ways off yet, but the spirit of Elijah. We know this because they questioned Jesus about John the Baptist. And, John the, and Jesus responded in answering, he said, you know, it's, it's written that Elijah is coming, but he said, I say unto you, Elijah's already come. He's talking about John the Baptist. And the spirit of Elijah came upon John the Baptist to pave the way for the first coming of the Lord Jesus. But that same spirit of Elijah also fell on the church on the day of Pentecost to pave the way for the next coming of Jesus. For you see, Jesus is coming. I said, Jesus is coming. I said, Jesus is coming. And the message, one of the messages, one of the emphases of the church today is to let the world know Jesus is coming. Glory to God. So the service began with the days of Elijah. And it's important to understand as you, as you, as you read and as we interpret the spirits of the, or the hearts of the fathers turning to the children and the hearts of the children turning to the fathers, that that has a special meaning not only for the church but for America. We as believers, we think of fathers as the fathers of faith here. But we also have to recognize as Americans, we had fathers of our nation as well. And in spite of the cancel culture and the desire for historical revisionism in some quarters, we cannot deny, I will not deny nor question that the founding of our nation was just and good and was ordained of God. This continent was discovered by a man named Christopher Columbus who has come under heavy fire in recent years for whatever reason we know what's behind it. But Christopher Columbus in his own writings 
declared he believed he had a mandate from God to discover new lands and take the gospel light to them. And his very name, Christopher, means Christ bearer or the bearer of Christ. Our founding fathers as well were inspired of God and motivated of God. And I heard Ted Cruz's father, Rafael Cruz, say something one time. I never had thought about it this way, but he was right. Next to the Word of God, the most inspired documents that, ever been, that have ever been written are our Declaration of Independence and our United States Constitution. There are those sects and cults that have their own books and Bible editions. When you read them in the light of the Spirit, they're a joke. You can tell that this is just nonsense in spite of the fact that there may be people that hold them in high esteem. But the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution, when you read that, there is an air of sacredness, holiness, and honor about them. And uh, we recognize that our Constitution was written with help and inspiration from heaven. We the people have been entrusted with something. The preamble of our Constitution reads like this. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And in this Constitution, with all the framework for the way our government works, they listed what is known as a Bill of Rights. And I presume everybody got a handout when you came in. And we did this just for your edification and information. Because a lot of times we talk about things without ever realizing what these things are. And I want to just briefly touch on the Bill of Rights with you for a minute. Because these are, as American citizens, our rights. You understand there is a difference between a right and a privilege. Driving a motor vehicle is a privilege. You have to have a license for it. Flying an airplane is a privilege. You have to have a license for it. It can be granted and it can be revoked. But rights are something that our founding fathers recognized were given us, not by man, not by government, but by God. And this Bill of Rights lists and enumerates these God-given rights. And it's important the way you look at this and understand it. Because if you understand that God has given you rights, then you also understand that man cannot take them from you. People have a twisted view of the law. And I think this is really is unique to the past just few generations. And it's because of the way we've been taught in school. American history replaced by social studies and civics and things like that. And we begin to, we begin to uh, uh, elevate the law to a place and government to a place that it was never intended to have. Amen. And you hear people talking about, well, the law allows me to do this. But no, the law doesn't allow you to do anything. The law, by definition, is not an allowance. It is a restriction. Every law is designed to restrict you from doing something, to restrict behavior. These are our rights. Sometimes questions are asked. What is the reason that you do this? What is the reason that you act this way? What is the reason that you flex these rights? The reality is when it's a right, you don't need a reason. You do it because it is a right. These are our rights, the First Amendment. Many people talk about the First Amendment, but do you know what the First Amendment literally is? There's actually five rights enumerated in the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Our founding fathers recognized that government had no business messing with the church. We came out of a society a culture, Great Britain, where there was a state religion. And our fathers didn't want anything to do with it. 
The church is the church. And your worship and your religion is your business. And it's none of the government's business. Therefore, they mandated that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. They can't tell us we can't come to church. They can tell us. They can try to enforce it, but it is our right to gather together, regardless of what the designer disease of the day is. Or abridging the freedom of speech. You have a right to speak truth. There is great pressure in modern culture, and a lot of it even has gotten into the legal system to try to put pressure on you to not say things the way they don't want you to say them. It is your right to speak truth. It is your right to say what you want to say. And no man has the right to take that away from you. This was the first thing that they said you have a right to. These are things that were of paramount importance. There are many amendments. The Bill of Rights is just the first ten. There are many more besides. But these were the ones that they instituted because they recognized how important it was and how dangerous it was if these things were not protected. Freedom of speech or of the press. Did you know that you have the same freedom of the press that the establishment media has? You may not know this, but there is no body, there is no governing body in the United States of America that issues press credentials. Any of the media corporations can print up passes that say press and have a photo ID on it and, you know, perhaps are recognized in certain circles. But you are the press as much as any CNN or Fox News correspondent. Every American has the right to freedom of the press. And if you want to report on it and take pictures, it is you're right. Or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. You have a right to speak out against government injustice. You have a right to challenge laws that are passed. You have a right. You are not the government's sheep. You are God's sheep. And you have a right to withstand tyranny. Can you say amen? amen? Tyranny is always enacted by degree. Let us remember the lessons of Nazi Germany. It did not happen overnight. It happened by increments. Little by little, freedoms were taken away from the German people, and specifically the Jews. Little by little, they were organized, corralled, controlled, and ultimately killed. We have to watch these incremental things happening because this is the nature of power and the nature of government. And our founding fathers understood that. And our hearts must turn again, the hearts of Americans must turn again to the founding fathers when it comes to the running of our nation. Thomas Jefferson said, I have sworn upon the altar of God, eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. I like that. I said I like that. Tyranny must be resisted in every form or fashion. Following the First Amendment is the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right, the right, the right, of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It's a right. You have a right to protect yourself. You have a right to protect your family. You have a right to keep and to bear arms. No man has any right to restrict that in your life. Now you may not like guns. You may not know anything about guns. You may buy into the rhetoric that, well, Assault weapons need to be taken away and restricted, and you don't need 
magazines that hold over a certain number of bullets and so on and so forth. But once again, we're talking increments. The goal of the devil is to shut you up, to take every right, to take away your right to petition, to take a right, away your right to redress a, grie a grievance, to take away your right to worship, to take away your right to defend yourself and your property. A lot of people don't know it, but the Second Amendment may be just as, if not more important than the First Amendment. You, you all know that this country started by a revolution. Revolutionary War began with an event. The British came out of Boston toward Concord, Massachusetts with the intent to take their guns away. And it was the resistance of those men. You've heard of Paul Revere and the one if by land, two if by sea, and the midnight ride and all that. That was all about gun control. And what stopped that was the shot heard around the world. They were after their guns because they knew if they could disarm the population, then they could control the population. A famous Japanese general said around the time of World War II that an attack on America would be suicide because behind every tree and every bush is a gun. <laughs> the devil would love nothing more and the government would love nothing more than to change that. But it is our right. And even if you're not a gun fan, don't let that influence your attitude toward rights. I may not like what you say, but I must defend your right to say it. I may not agree with how you worship, but I must, for everyone's sake, including my own, defend your right to do so. And this is no different. The Third Amendment, no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner. They cannot just move in on you. And in the time of war, except in a manner to be uh, prescribed by law. The Fourth Amendment is another very important one. We have a right to be secure in our persons, our houses, our papers, in effect, against unreasonable searches and seizures that shall not be violated, and, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Bottom line is, without a warrant, you don't have to let them into your house. And even if you've got nothing to hide, make them get a warrant. Hold on to your rights. The Fifth Amendment is another very important one, and I'll just paraphrase this one. Um, no one is required to testify against themselves. You have the right to remain silent. Exercise that right. I said exercise that right. Am I against law and order? Absolutely not. I'm as pro-law and order as anybody, but I just, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm pro-law not pro-governmental control. This is the law. This is the law. That no law shall be passed. The Seventh Amendment, the right to a jury trial in civil cases. The Eighth Amendment, no excessive bail or excessive fines or cruel and unusual punishment. The Ninth Amendment, the rights belong to the states. The Ninth Amendment is basically the attitude toward pro-small government. We should have and keep the vision to govern ourselves at the local level. The farther power is removed from the individual, the less the individual counts. You cannot, they cannot know in Washington what's going on here. Therefore, they cannot manage your life effectively from here. The peep, to the people belong the rights. And finally, the Tenth Amendment is that the rights not enumerated, not delegated to the Congress or to the, the United States, you know, to the, to the federal, at the federal level, belong to the states and to the people. Praise the Lord. These are our rights. These are our rights. Praise the Lord.
So it's important that you know your rights and it's important that where government is concerned, you flex your rights. We the people have been entrusted with rights and responsibilities. These rights are second to none in the earth. No government gives the people, no government has the restrictions, I should say, on it that our government has on it. But if we do not exercise those rights and hold our leaders accountable. Now, why am I talking about this? Because this is the way we honor the fallen dead. They purchased our rights. They protected our rights in blood, with blood. And we honor that blood by standing up for our rights and not letting any man or any system or any power encroach upon them. Elijah, when he was here in the earth, had a standoff. He was just a man, but God put his hand on him. And Elijah challenged the circumstances of his day. The leadership in Israel was backslidden and corrupt and worshiped idols. And in his day, the worst king and queen that Israel ever had, Ahab and Jezebel, and even today their names are still legendary, they were in power. Elijah rose up with the hand of God on him and challenged it. And the time came when there was a face-off. There on Mount Carmel, 500 prophets of Baal, 500 worshipers of, if you will, communism. Transism. Evil of every kind. Withstood one man with the hand of God on him. And they danced and they cut themselves and they, you know, prayed and they, 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 did, they did all their worshipful shenanigans. No telling what kind of hideous things were going on in that confrontation. Calling upon their God to answer by fire because that was the deal. Whoever's God answers by fire will serve him. That was Elijah's challenge. They didn't challenge him, he challenged them. And they danced and went through all their contortions and nothing happened. But now when you think about that, and you interject yourself into it with the current mentality, you may look at that in a fearful, timid kind of a light. But you've got to remember Elijah was having fun with it. And that's a very important part of my message to you today where Memorial Day is concerned. Let's have some fun with the power of God. Psalm chapter 2 says... Why do the heathen rage and imagine vain things? They seek to topple God off of his throne. The heathen rage, but God laughs. He that sitteth in the heaven laughs. God doesn't, he's not troubled about these things. He's having the time of his life. He's, he's happy. He's joyful. Why would he be joyful seeing some things that are happening going on today? Not joyful because they're happening, because joy, but he's joyful because you're here and because I'm here. And we got to partake of that attitude. Elijah mocked him. I, th I think Elijah was just laughing, you know, either covertly or overtly when he'd tell him, cry louder. He can't hear you. Maybe he's gone on a journey. Maybe he's gone to the bathroom. Holler louder. Dance harder. He's having a good time. And then the time came when they ran out of gas and had nothing else to offer and their God had not answered. And Elijah said, okay, stand back. It's my turn. I love that about him. And he didn't try to make it easy for God. He said, let's soak this thing down. Pour some water on that bull. Pour some water on that altar. We're going to have fire. Let's have fire. Let's have some Holy Ghost fire that water can't put out. 
And sure enough, God answered by fire. And that started a revolution. They eliminated the leadership of the sinful in Israel. They toppled an administration and they restored some things to the way they ought to be, or at least closer to the way that God wanted them than they had been in a long, long time. These are the days of Elijah. Part and parcel of the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost was the Spirit of Elijah. Now why do I mention that? Because today is also the day of Pentecost. Today we celebrate Pentecost. Tomorrow is Memorial Day, but today's Pentecost. And the Spirit of God was poured out on the church 2,000 years ago. The Spirit of Elijah was poured out on the church 2,000 years ago. And a little less than 250 years ago, it manifested itself in the settling and finding and founding of this nation. And part of that was because this nation was raised up to be a last day's tool of God to both spread the gospel to the world and to protect and act as a big brother to the nation of Israel. And we display these flags today. The American flag, of course, which is the symbol of our nation. The armed forces flags, the Air Force, the Army, the Marines, the Navy. But right there beside them all is the flag of Israel. Because this is who brought us the Word of God. And this is who the promise was made to in Abraham that his seed would be blessed. And today the United States stands as a protector of Israel. And I'm happy to report that until Jesus returns, America will, will continue to survive and thrive. Amen. God put us here. God wants us here. God needs us here. And what we're seeing is now the heathen raging. And our response is we're laughing because we know we've got the upper hand. You see, the, 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 the battles that took the lives of these youngsters that we honor today, these were flesh and blood battles. But the song also tells us these are the days of Ezekiel. And if you read the 28th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, then it's very clear in the truth that there are two governmental systems. Chapter 28 verse 1 talks about taking up a lament against the prince of Tyre, which was a major city in the Phoenician um, days, the Phoenician rule. And the prince of Tyre brings some indictments against him, and, and it ends with this. It says, but you're a man. You're a man. But then after he talks to the prince of Tyre, he refers to the king of Tyre. And he said, you were the anointed cherub. You were in the garden of God. And in that, we have revelation that there are two kingdoms. There is the kingdom that is occupied by men and that dwell in Washington or in the state capital of the given state, but there is also another kingdom. And as Paul said in Ephesians 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of this dark, the darkness of this world, and wicked spirits in heavenly places. But those wicked spirits in heavenly places are still not as high in the heaven as he that sits and laughs. And that's the seat that God anointed Peter to preach and closed the inaugural, inaugural sermon of the church on the day of Pentecost with God has raised him up and seated him at his right hand. And the scripture tells us that you and I are seated together in heavenly places. Never underestimate the power of one man anointed by the Spirit of God. but don't let the devil steal your laugh. Amen. Don't let the anger that's in the world distract you and pull you into a flesh and blood battle. These are the days of Ezekiel, and we see these kingdoms, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We celebrate Memorial Day, and we celebrate Pentecost. Pentecost is about the ultimate liberty. 
Pentecost was also conferred upon us by the shedding of blood. But it's the blood of Jesus. And as Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Child of God, just as John the Baptist came to introduce and, lay, and, and pave the runway for the first coming of Jesus, the Messiah, so the spirit of, of Elijah is on the church today, and our job is to pave the way for the coming again, the approach once again of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and our job is many, many faceted. Our job is to reach the world with the good news. Our job is to tell people that Jesus is coming and get people ready and cleaned up for heaven. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's the name of Jesus that opens the door to victory. It's the blood of Jesus that paid the price for our liberty and our joy today. We can laugh because we're covered by the blood. Glory to God. And letting people know, letting the world know that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will receive that same liberty. Our job is to build believers and to keep one another encouraged and to keep each other pumped up. And if I sound like a cheerleader sometimes, it's because I am. Go team, go. Give me a J, give me an E, give me an S, give me a U, give me an S. We're Jesus people, glory to God. And you're gonna prevail. You're not going under, you're going over. I don't care what they tell you at work. I don't care what they say on the news. I don't care what the price is in the grocery store. I don't care about all that. God is moving and things are changing. Stand free in your rights, glory to God. You've got a right to shout. You've got a right to praise. You've got a right to sing. You've got a right to celebrate. Jesus reigns and I reign with him. And no ism, no ism. Socialism, Marxism, communism, none of those isms are any match for the blood of Jesus. And the name, there's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. That's the song of the New Testament believer. You got your gods out there, bring them on. There's no God like my Jesus. Oh, I wish I had a friend in this place. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We the people, the people of America and the people of God, we've got to hold our leaders' feet to the fire and make them do what they said they would do. We've got to let our voices be heard. We've got to insist that the righteous rule and reign in this place. And if there's somebody that's in the wrong place, if there's someone unrighteous in an office, we get him out, glory to God. We hope he gets saved, but we demand that he go. And in doing so, we will help ensure that the blood of our fallen protectors was not shed in vain and that the future blood of our sons and daughters will not be shed recklessly or needlessly. Sometimes the task seems daunting and the enemy's many, but Elijah learned that lesson too. He did what he did and then the next thing that happened was he was hit by a piece of bad news and he headed for seclusion, hiding out. But God came to him. God showed up where he was, and he said, what are you doing here? Amen. Elijah said, Lord, I'm in this all by myself. There's nobody with me. And God said, Elijah, I've got 7,000 people in Israel who have not bowed to these false gods. And the word of the Lord today to my heart is, there's more of us than there are of them. It sometimes doesn't seem like it because they control so much of the media and the, the talking heads and, 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 and the, the intellectuals and their training has them touting this false doctrine. But there's more of us, just like we saw there in that video, those Marines singing, No God Like Jehovah, there's more that be with us than there be with them. Glory to God. James 5, 17 reminds us, Elijah was a man. Amen. You're a man. Yeah. I'm a man. Amen. 
But it wasn't the man alone that did it. It was the man with the hand of God on his life. His power set change in motion. His words brought revival and victory. His prayer brought the reign of heaven and overthrew a corrupt government. Never underestimate the power of one man upon whom the Spirit rests. These are the days of Elijah. These are the days of Pentecost. These are the days of the Spirit of God poured out in our lives. These are the days of the coming of the Lord. And so today as we celebrate this day, let's remember, we honor those whose blood was shed the blood of our sons and daughters, our brothers, our sisters, our parents and grandparents. But we also honor the blood that was shed, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that paved the way for this nation to even exist. I will protect it. I will stand against any tyranny. I will not, I will not give up my shout. I will not give up my joy. I will not give up my laugh. Wokeism to the contrary notwithstanding, I will not. I will not. I refuse. Glory to God. Now I invite you this morning, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, whether in this room or in the live stream audience or watching this delayed by video, I encourage you right now to just bow your head. We in this room are going to pray a prayer. And I want you to pray this prayer out loud as well. Because we're praying it to support you. Those of you that have never made this invitation. You want the Spirit of God working in your life. You want to become the new creature that Jesus spoke of. You want to know what it's like to have the Creator living inside you. You want to know what it's like to walk in the power of God and be led by the Spirit of God, to avoid the landmines and the perils of natural life, and to know that no matter what happens, I have a home not made with hands. I'm going to see my Savior. You invite Jesus into your life. Let's all bow our heads, and everybody, in support of those who may have never prayed this prayer, let's all say it out loud together. And say it loud and say it bold and once again reaffirm your confidence in the blood of Jesus. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I call upon your name today. I believe there's salvation in your name. I believe you died on the cross, shed your blood, so that I could have life eternal. I call upon your name today. I call upon your grace today. I declare that you are Lord of my life. And now I believe. Your word declares, I am a new creature. I'm saved. I'm a child of God. God is my Father. The church is my family. Heaven is my home. I'll see my Savior someday. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Now I expect to be led from this day forward by your Holy Spirit. And I thank you for beginning a work in my life. Now pray this prayer. And I, you, and I ask you, as it was on the day of Pentecost, let your spirit fall upon me. Let me experience the power of the Holy Ghost and what it means to not just be born of your spirit, but to be filled with your spirit. I believe that I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Glory to God.